And a, a new spot in the garden today. Um, it's clear that a lot of what happens to us is just sheer chance. Um, but every now and then these random events occur which have a, a greater disproportionate impact on our lives. Um, people have investigated this, it's become very topical, you know, the, the black swan theory of Nicholas Taleb, very interesting book, very, very convincing theory. What I want to talk about today is how sometimes these chance encounters, these chance events, affect us in a perhaps a more subtle way that we only realise much later in life. I want to tell you about my road to Damascus moment, except it wasn't a road to Damascus, it was a train to Pretoria. It goes like this. When I was a, a kid, at the end of the year, we'd have the National Schools Chess Championships, which I took part in regularly from the age of 11 to 17. Um, our union wasn't particularly financially well off, so we travelled to the tournament by train, um, South African Railways. Now, it wasn't the Orient Express. Uh, the 1,000 kilometre trip to Pretoria took two days, um, no bullet trains. It wasn't really luxury, and after a day on the train, I'd got, frankly, bored. I'd, I'd had enough sitting in the compartment with my friends and the, the, the teammates, so I went for a wander on the train and I bumped into some boarders from my high school who were going home for the, for the Christmas holidays. We got chatting and I lost track of time, as those who know me well is quite common. And eventually we arrived in Johannesburg, which I thought was the city just before Pretoria. Certainly is on the map. I went out, of the, went out on the platform looking for my carriage. I went up, I went down. Panic started to well up. It was nowhere to be found. Now, it's one thing losing your car keys. It's another thing losing a train, com a train carriage. It turns out that at Germiston, the train had split in half. One half went to Joburg and one half went on to Pretoria. So there I was, a few rand in my pocket. Uh, didn't know anyone in Johannesburg that I could think of at the time, 15 years old, and I'd lost my train. I dashed off to the ticket office, I thought, well, maybe I can buy a ticket, and I had just enough money, with a few cents left over, to buy a ticket to Pretoria. It was leaving any moment, so I sprinted, found the platform, asked for directions, leapt onto train, you know, adrenaline rush, and off we went. Now, again, I was relying on my somewhat patchy knowledge of geography and train transport, and I had this idea that Pretoria was quite close to Joburg, and... and it was probably, I'd probably be there if I was in a car in half an hour. So I gave myself an hour on the train. An hour in, and we're in pastoral scenery. Idyllic, sunshine splashed, cows and trees, uh, no cities in sight. And I sort of had that second feeling on the journey of, of absolute panic. And then something strange happened. You know, a sense of calm fell over me, and I'd, I'd had a thought. You know, there's nothing I can do. I'm on the train. There's nowhere to get off. I might as well just enjoy the ride. Sat back. I started daydreaming, thinking about the tournament that lay ahead, looking out the window at the scenery, and I relaxed, and I really enjoyed the ride. It turns out that um, the train doesn't go from Johannesburg to Pretoria. It, it takes a detour around the whole of the Vartus Front and eventually gets to Pretoria via a lot of small places along the way, um, which I hadn't anticipated, never having been on this train before. And a few hours in, we arrived in Pretoria. I was initially relieved, and then I thought, wait a second... And in Pretoria, I've got down to my last few cents. And actually, I have no real idea where I was going. I thought a little bit and I somehow remembered seeing something that, our, that we were staying at the German school hostel. I thought, OK, I know what to do. Got out a phone book, phone booth and, and 
looked up German school hostel. Nothing. Not a German school's hostel in sight. And at that point I thought, well, you know, I'm 15. Um, there's no point panicking. 15-year-olds will be helped. Someone's going to... Some nice gentleman or lady is going to uh, rescue me. Um, but probably I need to announce myself. So I found an, an information booth, went up to the guy and told him my story. I'd, you know, I'd lost my train in Johannesburg. I'd spent all my ill-gotten gains and, and um, tuck money on a ticket to Pretoria. I'd arrived in Pretoria, tried to find the German school hostel, and... Uh, I'd drawn a blank. And he chuckled, uh, you know, I mean, this probably wasn't the most typical information request that he'd had during the day. And he, he turned out to be a really nice man. And he said, look, I can help you. I spent a long time living in southwest Africa, as it, were, as it was known then, you know, now Namibia, which had been once upon a time a German colony. So German is actually spoken in southwest Africa. And he said, look, you've gone about it all wrong. You should be looking for the German school hostel. You should be looking for the Deutsche Schulheim. My apologies to my German friends uh, for my appalling pronunciation. Likewise with the Afrikaans, by the way, this was not my strong point at school. Um, so he looked it up, and sure enough, there was a, a Deutsche Schulheim. He gave them a call, and before long, um, my somewhat worried team manager arrived to take me back to um, our, our hostel where we were staying. Um, I mean, he had every right to be worried because he'd been completely unaware that I'd left the team. Uh, until we'd arrived there, he was totally unaware that um, I was missing. Whether this had something to do with the fact that he anaesthetised himself to, to train travel in a time-honoured way, playing cards with a couple of the players and drinking an enormous amount of brandy. You know, I don't want to say that was the, the cause, but maybe it had something to do with it. Anyway, he was, relieve, he was relieved. He'd um, found his top board player had been rescued and we were ready for the tournament. As it happens, this was good preparation. It was sort of my, my breakthrough tournament. I'd performed well above expectation. I had a fantastic time and all's well that ended well. And I thought about it afterwards, and, and it was something of a, you know, I don't want to say an epiphany, but it was a pivotal moment. And there's an obvious message there for me, and I think it's a, a message that a lot, of, a lot of us take away at different points in our lives, that, you know, whatever happens, something happens, you know, and you'll be okay. Except for the moments when you when you aren't, when you know those truly terrible moments, and then you'll deal with those um, as best you can. Now that's the obvious takeaway, but I thought about it, and, and I've realised it affects me on a more subtle but profound level. You know, after school and university, I started travelling. I went to the UK. From the UK, I ended up in Peru. From Peru, I moved to Brazil, and here I am now, tucked away in, in the northeast of Brazil, in the most unlikely of places. You know, certainly unpredictable, given you know everything that you might have known about my you know childhood and university days. How much of that is down to the, the sort of successful outcome on that one moment? Because all my travel since then has been done in, in a way in which I've done some sort of background reading and research, um, procrastinated, well, you know I do that, uh, left at the last minute, and then just rolled the dice and, you know, where the chips fall, that's where I'm going to end up, and it'll be okay. And I, and I think it's been, you know, pretty much my modus operandi um, ever since school. And it, a question struck me when I was thinking about, you know, well, actually thinking about this this little chat. You know, if that trip had gone horribly wrong, if people had, I don't know, shouted at me, um, if no one had come to help me, if 
the tournament had been a disaster and everyone had said afterwards, well, you know, it's your own damn fault. Um, plan things a little bit better in future and it won't turn out badly. You know, if something had gone dreadfully wrong, would I have carried on um, taking that approach to, to decision-making? And I don't think I would. Um, and I'm kind of struck with the idea that, you know, this is certainly true for me, but, you know, how many of us, if we really trace it back to a pivotal moment when we were growing up, some kind of chance event that could have gone, you know, could have turned left instead of right, you know, the sort of two roads diverged in a wood, but it's not, you know, I took the left road or the right road or whatever Robert Frost said. You know, if it wasn't your choice, but if it was just, you know, how the cards played out and it had absolutely nothing to do with you and that's what made all the difference you know and someone else chose chose to take a cavalier approach and just spiral downwards i took a cavalier approach and you know i lived a fantastically lucky fortunate life ever since and how much of that luck and good fortune is just because i have faith in it because of that one lucky turn of events at the at, you know when I was 15 I don't know um I'd be interested to hear if you've had some sort of pivotal moment in your life that you think made all the difference and was just blind luck when you when it comes down to it you know if you have tell me about it in the comments below and then if not until the next time ciao